Hello Sunday School class, it's uh, time for another lesson from Come Follow Me. This particular lesson we are going to be looking at uh, the, some of the chapters from the book of Alma that detail uh, some of the preaching of Alma the Younger and the Sons of Mosiah among the people of the Lamanites and a couple of the key takeaways from that time. So there are three major things that we can take away that I identified that we can take from these chapters. Number one, that true conversion to the gospel results in a change in your life. Number two, that it asks us to consider how we will respond to those who have changed their lives. And number three, there's a phrase in there about that the word of God will have no obstruction among them. It's from a proclamation that the king of the Lamanites declares among his people. And I wanted to talk about what that means because I think that's important for you to understand and know moving forward in your lives, uh, whether you go on a mission and as you move forward in the church and in your life as new challenges arise, because new challenges will arise. Okay, so first of all, number one, um, these uh, the individuals in this chapter, Alma the Younger and the Sons of Mosiah, are examples of what happens when you, re when you have truly repented and become converted. If you remember, it was said of Alma and Ammon's sons that they went abroad throughout the land seeking to destroy the church. And then they transform themselves, repent, and then go to their father and say, hey, we'd like to go preach among the Lamanites. Remember, the Lamanites were people that they had totally given up on. They were totally irredeemable. There was no way to reach them, which brings up the first question to ask yourself. Are there people that you know that you believe are beyond the reach of the atonement? And I bring this up because I served a mission in Austria, which is a nation rife with what you would call Nazis. And I mean real Nazis, not just people you don't agree with. I mean, these are people who were into the extermination of other peoples, which is a very Lamanite thing to do. We were forbidden to preach to people who were known members of the Nazi movement. But I have to, to ask myself, can Christ reach them? Because if you look at uh, Alma the Younger and the sons of Mosiah, they were trying to destroy the church. And they're not the only ones in Scripture. They're just some of the most prominent ones in the Book of Mormon who were once ag totally against everything, who then become some of the greatest advocates. And that's really one of the messages of the atonement of Christ is that anyone can be saved by Christ's sacrifice. Now, that doesn't mean they want to be. And and if you asked me to detail my experiences with the with the, uh, the Nazis I met on my mission, I'll tell you right now, they were not interested in changing one whit. But there were lots of other Austrians who weren't interested in changing anything. We had this one guy that we taught, uh, Michael berger Vigla, and uh, we got to the fourth discussion back then, which was on chastity, and taught him about living in sin because he had a girlfriend that lived with him. And I remember Michael asked me, what do I need to do? And I said, well, you have two options. You either need to get married or you need to live separately. And to Michael's great credit, he went and proposed to her. I mean, this is the kind of attitude. We, I mean, he was a member referral, so we're stoked. Like, oh man, he's super ready. And she said no. And he decided not to separate living situations. Now, a couple of years ago, I found out that he has since been baptized. I guess they separated for other reasons, and he did eventually join the church. Um, he was ready to make the change, and, and that's what we hope for, is people who are ready to change their lives and be what God asked them to be and put away their past lives. And if you look at the anti-Nephi Lehi's, as they decided to call themselves, one of the things their king asked them to do was take all their weapons and bury them in the ground and promise that they would never go to war again. And that was because this was an outward symbol of their commitment to follow Christ and to live as he had asked us to live in loving our neighbors. True repentance and conversion requires that we abandon things and maybe people in our lives that made it possible or tantalizing to commit sin. And you'll see this all the time. Um, if you go to any kind of 12, 13 step program, they'll tell you to stay away from the bars from the women, from whatever it is, because sometimes in order to get away from sin, you have to get away from opportunities to sin and abandon things that made it possible for you to, that kept you away from the Savior and kept you away from being the kind of person that you could be. Um, I've given this, I've mentioned this story in a talk before, but I had a friend in high school, we'll call Richard, 
uh, who, when I first encountered him, he was in high school and I was in junior high school. And I s remember seeing him a few times at uh, weekly activities with the youth. And he was that typical drug dealer stereotype, you know, gray hoodie, very moribund, dark. I think he even like wore eyeshadow and stuff. That doesn't matter. Just whatever stereotypical image you have of drug dealer in your mind, that's what Richard looked like. And um, so then I finished junior high and started uh, high school as a freshman. And uh, I met Richard, like really met him. And between those two years that summer, Richard told me later that he had had a visitation very similar to Alma the Younger's, maybe not as dramatic, where he'd been told to straighten up and fly right. And uh, I remember sitting at lunch with him because we were the only two members of the church who had lunch in the same time block. And he would tell me about the stuff he was learning in the scriptures. And I have, I have like a three ring binder that's like three inches thick. And a lot of the things I wrote in there are the things he shared with me about the gospel. As far as I could tell, Richard had become a new person. And, and I knew he was the same guy, you know, because he looked the same, but I didn't recognize him anymore. It was like a totally different person. And there were members of the church and of the ward who expressed their concerns to my parents that I was hanging out with Richard because they knew about his past. And, uh, but I, you know, to my parents' credit, they weren't bothered by who he had been. They were more concerned with who he was. And last I heard from Richard, he was, he went on a mission and things were looking up. And I hope that things have continued because he was basically as close to Alma the Younger and the Sons of Mosiah as I've ever personally known in my life. Um, so two other questions around this first point, then we'll move on to the second point, are what can we do in our lives to continue to have spiritual experiences that reinforce our conversion? Number two, what do we need to remove from our lives in order for the Lord to have a greater presence in them? I went for an entire year without internet. It was an illuminating experience. It was 2019. I didn't have internet. I mean, I had it at work because, you know, work, it's not an option, but I didn't have it at home. I didn't have a smartphone until December of that year. And so I couldn't get on the internet whenever I wanted to. And it was illuminating what things did not distract me anymore. Because the adversary doesn't have to, you know, let's see, C.S. Lewis wrote that murder is no better than cards if cards will do the trick. And, if it, and he doesn't have to get you to do anything great. He just has to keep you from doing things that are right. Number two, this is a good segue from my Richard story. How do we respond to those who change? Now, when the anti-Nephi-Lehi's become anti-Nephi-Lehi's, their king dies, and then Lamoni's brother becomes the king, and there's some tumult in, in the kingdom because all of the Nephite dissenters who have left the Nephites and joined the Lamanites are threatening to kill them. And they actually do kill like 5,000 of them. But the king is persuaded by Ammon and his brothers to petition the king of the Nephites for entry, asylum essentially, among the Nephite kingdoms. And they eventually are given a, a, a place to live, which is what you would call the country of Belize today. And they're moved into there, and the Nephites then move in and, and agree to protect them from the armies of the Lamanites. And it's interesting to me, because they don't talk a lot about it, how easily it seems that the Nephites were willing to let the Lamanites come. Because it, it begs the question for us, how easily would we allow others to change, to accept that the Atonement of Christ has made those changes, and to welcome them into our midst? I taught a guy on my mission named Alfred Pitzal, and Alfred Pitzal was a... I guess you'd call him a Section 8 housing resident in the United States. He lived in an apartment complex uh, in the 23rd District, Floridsdorf of Vienna. And basically, his entire apartment was the size of the room I'm sitting in now, plus a bathroom. And the government provided for it. And, and he didn't have to work. He didn't have to pay for anything. And I, and I think he got a small stipend of cash, which he basically used to buy smokes. <laughs> um, and that was his life, as he sat there, watched TV, and smoked and ate. And I have no idea what he ate, just that he, you know, sometimes I think I'm fat, he was bigger. So, uh, so we eventually persuaded him, uh, I think after about of teaching him for a month, to come to church. And he came to church, and he stayed for the first two hours, sacrament meeting and Sunday school, and he didn't stay for priesthood. And after he left, we went into priesthood, and the bishop expressed his relief that Alfred wasn't there anymore because he stank. 
And the bishop, Bishop Bersendorfer, nice guy, super rich, was called to repentance by the area authority, Elder Hoos, who said, you've read the Book of Mormon. Who do you think the missionaries are going to bring? If you want the missionaries to teach people who are not poor, then you need to go out and invite your friends to hear the missionaries. <laughs> I love Elder Hoos. Elder Hoos was released as a, as a member of the 70 a couple of years ago. Um, I guess he's like the only general authority I'd ever met uh, until I met Elder Holland a couple of years ago. Um, but I loved it. He was right. What, how are we supposed to respond? Because generally speaking, who are the people who are most likely to listen? The people who are humbled, usually because they're poor. They're poor, they're sick, they're troubled in some way, and so they're open to the message of the gospel. But sometimes it's worse than that. I mean, think about if you're a member of the church when Alma the Younger becomes the prophet later. And you're like, wait a minute, isn't he the guy that like was trying to destroy the church? Or Saul, who becomes Paul in the Old Testament, or New Testament, sorry, um, where it asks us to consider how would we respond if the Lamanites suddenly came in mass to our area? Because I'll tell you what, we sort of have that. There are, in this stake that we live, a lot of poor people. Elder, um, Elder Dieter, sorry, Elder Uchtdorf, talked about when he was young and a member of the church how the members in Germany would complain about the people he called canned peach Mormons who joined the church just to get welfare. And that is a huge problem in this part of the valley where there are a ton of people who are interested only in what the church can do for them financially. And it's a real risk. I remember doing a baptismal interview as a missionary for a guy, and I'm like, I don't really know if if he's going to keep the covenants. And I remember you know, going into another room and kneeling and praying, and the Lord said, it's not your responsibility to worry about that. Is he, willing, is he ready to make the covenants? Yes. It's not your problem if he doesn't keep them. So I gave them permission to baptize him. But anyway, I wasn't planning on telling that story. But do we actually allow the atonement of Christ to wipe people clean? So I go back to my friend Richard. Richard and I became good friends for about two years before he went on his mission. And then I never heard from him again because that's what happens when you grow up military and you move around the country and you don't have the internet. Um, but there were members of the ward who all they could see is Richard the drug dealer. They didn't see Richard the, the striving scriptorian because Richard was at seminary every day. In fact, he drove most of the kids who came. He made it possible for them to all go to seminary every morning. I had no idea who Richard the drug dealer was. I had never actually met him, but that's all some of these people could see. So imagine one day if somebody who really hurt you is brought into the church or maybe elevated to become the prophet. I mean, imagine if the kid who picks on you now one day becomes the prophet, how will you respond? Because I have to, I have a personal issue with this myself. The person on this planet who has most wronged me more than anyone else is my ex-wife. And I repeatedly wondered to myself how I will respond if I learn that she's been rebaptized. Now, I don't think based on conversations I've had with uh, the stake president at the time that I'm going to be required to you know, live with her and stay married to her or anything. But I have to ask myself, will I believe that she has truly repented? Will I accept her repentance? And will I treat her as if she is someone who has come to Christ? Because she's wronged me greatly. And I won't elaborate on anything. Just that no one on the planet has done more wrong to me than she has. Would I let the Savior rescue her? I don't know. But it's a good question for all of us. Will you let the Savior redeem those, even the people that you don't know and don't like? It's for them too. It's for all men, not just the ones you like. All right, finally, final point is there's a comment uh, that the king of the Lamanites makes just before they leave. He declares that the church will have no obstruction. He passes a law making it illegal to persecute the missionaries, illegal to persecute Ammon and his brothers, because they've been in jail, if you remember, uh, in prison for a long time, and they were really, really in bad shape, sort of like Alma the Elder back in Zeezrom uh, and Alma and Amulek. So they... He passes this law so that the church will have no obstruction. Now, there was still persecution. Having no obstruction does not mean there will not be any problems. It does not mean there will not be any trials, any hiccups. 
There's this misbegotten notion that some people have that once you join the church that everything is, you know, rainbows and butterflies and skittles fall from the ceiling. But that's not really how it happens. That happens to some people, but for most people, it actually ups the ante on difficulties in their lives. Because now you're a threat. If you've really become converted, Satan doesn't go, oh, no, they're Christians now. I can't touch them. He goes, damn it, they became Christians. I have to do something about this. Because at the moment of conversion, you are the weakest. C.S. Lewis wrote in the Screw Tape letters that um, at the beginning, God sets us off with a lot of, with a lot of help and easy conquest over temptation and, and the gospel seems sweet and it's easy and, and it's you know, all this great stuff. But he never allows that to, to last for very long. And, and that's when we lose a lot of people because um, God withdraws the, the shiny, flashy support. He hasn't withdrawn his support. It's just no longer trumpets and fanfare. And he, quote, leaves the creature to decide from the will alone if it's willing to follow. And that is the and the reason for that is it's the moment where you decide how dedicated you are, how converted you really are, how much you are willing to actually act on the promises that you have made for you to decide. He already knows. You've already made the commitment, but now it's time to back it up or back it off. And so he withdraws, if not literally, at least consciously, a lot of those incentives and leaves us on our own to figure it out. Now, what he doesn't remove is he doesn't remove his spirit from us. Um, Elder Busha, a former member of the 70 from Germany, said in a talk in 1996 that the spirit is always trying to talk to you and that you should listen and follow the uncomfortable suggestions that he makes and that light will pour into your life. But what happens is, is when God withdraws the fanfare, the fanfare of the world comes in and we get distracted in the din and dissonance of the devil and we have difficulty hearing the spirit because we're caught up with Netflix and the internet and bills and COVID-19 or whatever it is that's distracting us um, from what we used to have that helped us to concentrate. One of the things that I miss about church is that there was a regular time to go in, get dressed, sit down and focus on the Savior. I don't have that anymore. It's a blessing to have a church service. Because it's not just whenever you want to, which is good too, but there was a time where no matter what, week by week, month by month, we sat down and we thought about Christ. And we didn't let other things get in the way. Well, or there was less of an opportunity for those things to interfere with our ability to hear. And so there was no obstruction for the word. And why does it matter that there be no obstruction? In that same talk I mentioned from Elder Busha, he said this, Quote, you want to be good and do good? That is commendable. But the greatest achievement that can be obtained in this life is to be totally under the direction of the Holy Ghost. And he will tell you what is really good and necessary for you to do. End quote. That's powerful. Why do we want no obstructions? So that the Spirit can be in our life and tell us what's important for you. Years ago, in this congregation, there was a member named Gavin Sweeting from the UK. And uh, Gavin and I were in very similar circumstances. I'm now as old as he was then, both single. Uh, he had never been married. And we came out of conference one day and we're talking about uh, the things that we had uh, obtained in that conference. And I made a comment about something. And he said, remember, general conference is general instruction. He said, I don't think that applies to you. Because there's a, if you think about things Elder Bedner has taught, Elder Nelson has taught, um, even Elder Packer before he died, they all talked about the importance of personal revelation that comes in a spiritual circumstance. And that's why having the spirit at church and having a reverent circumstance matters and not just having church wherever you want. Because if you remove the distractions, the obstructions, then the spirit can be there and then there's less confusion about the message. One other thing that's important to remember, this is from a movie, I won't mention what the title is, but I thought this was very well said. It said, you must trust that, that, that God will speak to you in words you understand. And I'll tell you that, I, I have a different vocabulary from other people. So when I hear things in my mind, when I'm impressed with things, when I write stuff down, it sounds different because God will use different words with you to be sure that you know what they mean. Here's the reason why. 
I know that's true. On my mission, Elder Neely Maxwell gave a broadcast to the missionaries and said, you guys need to stop. Well, you guys didn't say that. I can't remember exactly what he said, so I'm paraphrasing. He said, stop reading the Book of Mormon in, your, in mission language as your language and scripture study at the same time. Unless, of course, you're in a mission where the mission language is your native tongue. Because the Spirit will speak to you in your native language so that there will be no confusion as to the message. And it's that, yeah. <laughs> because if you, if you think a word means one thing, because that's all you've ever learned in a dictionary, and he says that in another language, that's what you will hear. The Lord will speak to you in words that you understand. That's what personal revelation is about. The Spirit will help even when there are obstructions in your life. The devil doesn't really put bad ideas into your head as much as he acts in a way to make sure that it's impossible for the good ones to get in. That's what he really does. Yes, there are times where you are given impressions and things, but most of what he does is to try to make so much noise in your life that you can't hear the Savior talk. Years ago, I was applying for uh, security clearance going into the military. And I had a friend, um, we'll call him Peter. Not sure why, but uh, I had a chat with Peter and I, and I told him that what I was doing. And I said, I'm going to have to cut you out of my life because Peter was a drug dealer. And I had recently found that out because I was friends with his girlfriend. And, and she and I are still friends because they broke up and, and then she and I got, you know, got back in contact. Um, and we talk about Peter sometimes. Uh, last she heard, he was still a drug dealer. Because in order to make sure there are no obstructions, going back to point number one, to be truly converted, to stay converted, to have repentance mean things, sometimes you have to cut people and things out of your life. It's not just stop smoking like Alfred Pitzel had to do and wouldn't do while I was there. It's not just about uh, quitting gambling or cursing or whatever. It's about getting away from the behaviors and the people sometimes that cause you to commit sin. Even Abraham, or no, Lot and his family had to leave Gomorrah in order to get to a land of promise. They had to give up all the things that they had. Nephi's family had to leave Jerusalem and leave all their good things behind in order to have a good experience. And sometimes that's what's required. So here's a couple of questions with that in mind. What do you need to change in your life so that the spirit is easier to hear? Number two, what can you do to better act on whatever uncomfortable suggestions the Spirit may make? He's going to ask you to do stuff that sometimes doesn't make any sense, or stuff that's hard. The pain of sacrifice lasts only a second. It is the fear of the pain of sacrifice that makes us hesitate to do it. The Book of Mormon stories and principles show us about how important it is to make Christ the central cornerstone of our own lives. Because, as I said before, becoming converted and becoming clean is absolutely predicated upon whether or not Christ has become prominent in our lives. Number two, if Christ becomes prominent in our lives, we allow him to save others. Number three, when Christ becomes an important cornerstone in our life, and there are no obstructions to his attempts to communicate with us and help us in our lives. You want to call down fire from heaven? You have to be able to talk to the Lord. If you want blessings to rain down on you, then you have to be able to listen to him and recognize when he asks you to do things. The most important choices that you can make are choices that establish the presence of the Spirit in your life so that the Spirit can bring you closer to the Savior. Everything else is just window dressing. And I'm not saying that the commandments don't matter. The commandments and, and, and all the things they ask us to go to church, read our scriptures, pray, go to Sunday school, these are all opportunities and invitations for us to invite the Spirit into our lives so that he can teach us and change us so that we can come closer to Christ, to be like Christ because we're pure, to be like Christ because we accept others into the midst, and to be like Christ because we're able to directly communicate with the Father with no confusion about what the message is. Anyway, that's the message I took from these chapters. Uh, if you have other thoughts or comments, I appreciate them. 
I appreciate you guys because whether you're actual members of my class or people who've stumbled on this video accidentally, uh, it's all. This is probably my favorite thing to do on the internet is to to share my beliefs that they don't have anything to do with politics or or you know things of this world because this is really what matters most. Uh, like Elder Busha said, and I'll leave this with you is. The most important decision that you can make in your life is to become totally reliant on the Spirit, and then He will tell you what is truly good and necessary for you to do. I testify that that is true. Clean up your life so you can feel Him. Let others allow the atonement to, to purify your life and the lives of those around you, and remove obstructions in your life that make it harder for you to feel the Spirit and act on His promptings. And I promise you, that your life will improve, that you will feel better, even if the only thing you have to say for it, like I do, is that you sleep like a rock at night. It's a sign of a clear conscience, void of offense towards God and man. Wherever you are, whatever you're doing, God speed the right. God bless you, and we'll see you next time.